Hey, what's up everyone? Sean Sia here. So in this video, we're going to look at the physical demands of amateur rugby union. We're going to have a look at a study that was done and discuss the results. So first of all, I want to talk about why the data, why all the data, why is it important to look at the numbers and the stats? I've had people tell me, well, I just want to play the game. I don't care about the numbers. Um, it's good to know that recall accuracy after a game is around 45% for a coach in general. So if you think back of what happened during the game, uh, you'll remember about 45% of what happened. So not accurate at all. And it's hard to plan when you have such uh, numbers that are so off compared to reality. Um, so the idea with data is to be able to form a better model of reality. Uh, as Kier says, uh, whoever has the most accurate model of reality wins. And uh, so hopefully with better data, we can ask better questions and also uh, have a better decision-making process. So the study that we're going to look at, it was done on an amateur team in England, uh, the Cardiff Metropolitan University Rugby Union, uh, in the season of 2012-2013. Um, they looked at four games where they visually analyzed 10 players. Uh, so visually analyzed, they actually uh, looked at the game and used a dictaphone to uh, record what movements the players, the different players were uh, performing and they looked at five forwards and five backs every single game uh, just to note that the visual analysis was uh, validated in, against the video analysis as well just to make sure that this uh, method of recording of collecting data was uh, accurate enough um, so there's a couple reasons uh, I like this study um, first of all it's it's done on an amateur level team so even if it's not amateur amateur in the sense that uh, even amateur teams in England can uh, go up to a fairly high level. It's at least a notch or two down from the pro studies that we usually see. So for us that evolve at a, an, a purely amateur level, it's interesting to see some uh, numbers come out of uh, sections that are a little bit lower than the pro, division, pro divisions. I also like the fact that they tracked all positions uh, on the pitch, all positions of the players. So in one game they looked at, out of the five forwards, they looked at a front rower and then a um, maybe like a left, a left prop, a hooker, uh, two locks, and then um, two locks, and then a flanker. And then the next game they changed it around. So over the four games that they analyzed, they actually looked at all the fifteen different positions on the pitch. So it gives a fairly uh, good picture of what's going on. And the last thing I like about this study, what I like the most, is how they classified the results. So we'll look at it quickly here. Uh, essentially what they did is they broke up the different movements of the players into six different categories. There was standing still, walking, jogging, striding, sprinting, and static exertions. Static exertions covers everything that involves some kind of contact. So scrummaging, rucking, mauling, uh, lineouts, and tackling as well. Um, so the results we see here, they looked at the count of each uh, movement locomotion over the game. Uh, split it forwards, backs, and then looked at the average. They also looked at the total duration of each movement locomotion, so in total. And they looked as well at the mean duration of each movement locomotion, uh, all in seconds again. So what I did here to simplify a little bit, I uh, tried to uh, group those results into three different categories. So I made three boxes, the low intensity activity uh, box, the high intensity running box, and the high intensity static exertions box and so what I did is I took the standing still info and the walking uh, data and the jogging data and I put them all together I was, and I then combined the striding and the sprinting data into the high intensity running box and then uh, I looked at the contacts as a standalone uh, piece of information so we're going to look at a few graphs now to try and uh, see what what comes out from uh, that study so the first thing we're going to look at here is total time spent in each movement category so like i said before low intensity activities are in green high intensity running are is in orange and high intensity static exertions are in red so what's really interesting here is that the vast majority and that's an average value if you want all the uh, obviously all the all the the nitty gritty of the, the data, you can go and check out the study. I'll link it in the, in the comments below or in the description below. Um, what's really interesting here is that a large, large portion of the game is spent uh, performing low 
intensity activities, um, as opposed to what, uh, honestly, what I thought before. I thought there would be at least, you know, 75, 80% of the game that was um, at, uh, or at least at the, at the most, sorry, uh, eight, uh, 75 to 80% of the game that was done at low intensities. But that doesn't leave a lot of minutes at high intensity, which is really interesting. And we'll, we'll come back to this later. We can definitely see the big difference here. The forwards uh, do more high intensity work than the backs. Uh, so the backs are a little bit lazy on the pitch than the forwards are in general. That's true to say. Um, the forwards perform a lot of high intensity static exertions compared to the backs. We'll come back to this afterwards as well. So second graph we're going to look at is the total number of stride and sprint efforts in a game. Uh, so the blue uh, column is the total number of stride plus sprint efforts. So you can see that the backs perform on average uh, double the amount of uh, stride and sprint efforts, so high intensity running activity, uh, high intensity running efforts, and the, then the forwards, and the max number of sprints in green. So the, for, the backs were at 15 per game, and the forwards were at about five per game. Uh, total frequency of stride sprint efforts in a game. So you can see that the forwards performed either a stride or a sprint every, on average, four and a half minutes, and the backs was about every two minutes. Uh, the total number of high intensity static exertions in a game. Uh, was much, much higher for the forwards than the backs. I put the minimum and the maximum values here. So forward minimum value was 70, maximum was 100, and the backs was between 20 and 30. So you can see here, that's probably the, the biggest difference, and that was the biggest eye-opener for me, is how different the game actually is for the forwards compared to the, the backs in terms of the number of those high-intensity efforts that they have to produce uh, and also here, the frequency of high intensity static exertions, uh, the forwards on average perform one uh, high intensity effort, uh, high intensity static exertion effort every 45 seconds, uh, where the backs perform one every about three minutes, which is a big difference. So, and the last one we're going to look at is the ratio of high intensity running to high intensity psych exertion. So just looking at the high intensity work. So for the forwards, the high intensity work is composed, uh, 80% of it is composed of high intensity psych exertions and only 20% of high intensity efforts is composed of running. Whereas the back 60% is uh, striding and sprinting and 40% is any type of combative uh, actions. So we could look at all the, all the results summary here altogether. The distance per game is fairly similar, uh, but then as to the, the low intensity movement is a little bit different between forwards and backs. Uh, and you can see as you go down high intensity running, the, about double the amount of high intensity running for the backs compared to the forwards. Uh, the frequency is about uh, twice as elevated as well. The duration is similar between three and five seconds on average per rep. Uh, so that's, that's interesting to see. And uh, the biggest difference, and again, the biggest eye-opening uh, factor for me was the high intensity psych exertion and the difference between forwards and back. You can see here the backs perform between one to two minutes uh, total minutes of high intensity uh, combative exercises um, in a game, whereas the forwards are much, much higher between eight and 11 minutes total per game. Uh, they do between 70 and 100 efforts, and uh, their efforts are longer as well. Uh, they're upwards of five, six seconds, whereas the, the backs usually, whenever they do some kind of combative effort, is uh, under five seconds. And so you can see the frequency of, the, of those efforts. That's interesting to look at as well. The forwards perform one of those every 45 to 60 seconds, whereas the backs perform one every two to four minutes. Uh, the ratio that we looked at just before in the graph is uh, pretty eye-opening as well. And so what I named Game Changer all the way at the bottom is the total amount of high-intensity work performed during a game and then uh, the, the number of high-intensity efforts, and that's the running uh, and the uh, static exertions combined. Uh, so feel free to pause the video and take a snapshot of that if you want to use that later. So talk about the practical applications that this, uh, these results have, at least for me. Um, first thing is the, 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 the question, uh, and that's been in the, in the works for a while, but uh, there is now a question about the validity of some of the tests that we use 
uh, for our athletes. So if we say that we want to do uh, some type of endurance test, uh, we could literally use anything that's general. So like a Cooper test, a half Cooper test. Uh, people like to use the Bronco to assess conditioning. Um, but again, it's a very general test. It's not a rugby specific test because as we can see, rugby is composed of high intensity efforts uh, staggered across time. And we can, uh, we can even see that uh, another thing that's really interesting is, is how different the game is for the forwards compared to the backs. So again, coming back to the testing, uh, testing piece, I think it might be interesting to find some kind of, of sprint repeat test. I know there is the Welsh anaerobic tests, if uh, my memory serves, uh, that is a version of this, but I do believe that um, it sh we should try and find a, a version for the forwards that would involve some kind of combative that is quantifiable so that uh, as we repeat those efforts, we can see if uh, the forwards are able to repeat those efforts throughout the test. Um, one option that's interesting is uh, a test that Kier set up for his uh, American football guys called the tribe test, which is essentially a five second effort uh, five seconds on, 25 seconds off test. Uh, you start uh, from a standstill. When it beeps, you sprint to the 20 meter line. He does it with the yards, obviously, because he, he's on a football pitch. But uh, we could technically do this on a, a, a rugby pitch between the, the two 10 meter lines with the, the midline in the middle. So uh, you start at the beep, you sprint 20 meters, turn around, and then sprint back. And then the person that is working with you to, to kind of grade the test uh, is going to make a mark or is going to write down on every work interval how much distance you covered in five seconds so you might do uh, 27 meters on the first one then you might do 27 meters again then you might do 26 then you might do 25 uh, and so the idea is to repeat this five seconds on 25 seconds off 12 times so for a total of six minutes uh, and uh, at the end you can see the decrease in uh, output between the first and the last, you can draw an average as well. Uh, so you can play with those numbers afterwards, but it is interesting, at least for the backs, I think, uh, some kind of version of this test for the, the, the backs in rugby would be interesting, but it, because the sport is a repeat sprint sport. And so that test might bring something more than a Bronco or some other kind of general conditioning test. Uh, and again, it would be good to find a version for the forwards where they also have to do five seconds of work, but more geared towards uh, combats, so upper body, uh, more tension as well, uh, which is hard to do in, in a group setting. Uh, we could find some, some versions with individuals, but to do it on a, on a team uh, scale, I haven't found the, the, the good option yet. So if you do think of anything, <laughs> Make sure you leave that thought in the comments below. Um, after the test validity um, implication, I also think about the high effort training. Are we doing enough of repeat intense efforts with our players? So um, at least for me, that I know that since last year, we've been doing some sprints, some pure sprint work, uh, and also some conditioning. So kind of both ends of the spectrum, but we haven't done much repeat sprint training. Uh, which is something that we are going to implement more this year. And for me, the biggest question is what about the forwards? Uh, they need a lot of high intensity repeat efforts with their upper body. So how do we include that into their conditioning? Uh, another thing that I'm going to do this year compared to last year is split the forwards and the back halfway through the, the preseason uh, so that I can be more specific with the type of conditioning that I do with them. So uh, following the data that came out of this study, the forwards will be doing a lot more upper body uh, high intensity efforts uh, for conditioning in a repeat kind of effort manner uh, rather than doing a ton of running. They'll run too. They'll, they'll, we, they need the legs uh, and they'll have the legs, but they definitely need to be comfortable uh, getting down and off the floor doing some rocking, doing some, uh, doing some scrummaging, uh, all those tackling, getting back up, tackling again. All those efforts need to be trained in the conditioning phase so that they can just be better uh, on the field uh, uh, when they're playing. Uh, so those are my, uh, my kind of um, conclusions that I drew from uh, the study. If, if you have any you know, questions or ideas, I'd love to hear them. So make sure you drop a comment below the video and uh, for everybody else thanks a lot for watching i appreciate it and make sure you like uh, share the video and subscribe and i'll see you soon for another video